Welcome to EDW 2021. I'm really excited to kick off this conference. This is our first time doing it. And this year we have two days of talks plus Q and A. So ask your questions in chat while the talk is happening. And then a moderator will queue them up and interview the presenter after each talk. Before I get too far into the state of the platform, I want to talk a little bit about EDW itself. We've wanted to do EDW for years. There are a lot of great conferences in this space, but nothing quite like this. There are a lot of great technical conferences, but they're mainly focused on bringing together people already working in open source software. These are great opportunities for collaboration between projects, but you see a lot of the same faces there. And there are some events that are focused on outreach, but they're usually marketed towards consumers or the enterprise. And they're often more of expo style events or feature a lot of demo talks. EDW is both a technical conference and an outreach event, but we're primarily focused on app developers. And we want to take a strong education focus so that you come away from EDW with new skills, not just more information. And we want to try to reach people outside of the existing free and open source software circles. As we grow, we want to take a holistic view with the type of talks we feature and include development adjacent subjects. Code is just one part of what we do as app developers. So we want to feature talks about design, accessibility, entrepreneurship, and even things like audience engagement. And of course, EDW is focused on the elementary OS platform. Elementary is in a unique position in the Linux-based operating system space. We provide a desktop environment. We make a suite of first-party apps. We build an operating system to ship those things. And we build an app store so that you can ship your apps. Without the distros, you may only get one or two of those things. And the rest are add-ons developed by a bunch of different organizations. So we're always thinking about the complete developer story from the first read of the docs all the way through publishing an ethical monetization to make sure that app development is sustainable. And I think that focus has paid off. We have nearly 200 apps written specifically for App Center and Elementary OS. These are all new apps, not ports, and they're all open source. So far, we've paid out about $14,000 to app developers. And we use the same pay what you can model as Elementary OS. The average purchase price for an App Center app is about $2.50 right now. It's pretty clear that we need to expand, but this is a really great start. Last year, we campaigned on this idea of App Center for Everyone, where we tried to reimagine a more cross platform App Center. It's still elementary OS first, has the same high quality and the same native integration. But we also want to make App Center apps available for other Linux based operating systems like Ubuntu or Fedora. So developers can write once for elementary OS and reach millions of Linux users. Now, some say that the higher barrier to entry for native apps is unattractive or native app development is dead, but we disagree. We're building a regulated marketplace with the highest quality and only using open standards. Think of it like the California standard in vehicle emissions, but for apps, we want to set a high bar that everyone benefits from. And we're already attracting developers by providing a complete and compelling platform. And in some ways, it's a lot more straightforward than the web-based platforms. So what does that look like in 2021? Well, let's start with Vala. Vala is the programming language that we use at Elementary to write all of our first party apps. It has a modern syntax and modern language features. It's very productive. So we want to spend a lot less time writing boilerplate code. And we think that the best code is code that's easy for humans to read. Vala transpiles to C, so it's fast and it's native. And it's built specifically for the G stack. In fact, glib is a native namespace in Vala. So you get a huge utility library right out of the box. That includes things like settings, time and date utilities, 
platform APIs like actions and notifications, IPC over DBus, and even file operations. Plus, Vol is compatible with tons of other libraries, and there are expansive API docs on voladoc.org. We build all of our source code with Mason. The Mason build system's popularity has taken off among open source projects over the past couple years. It uses a simple, non touring complete DSL, but if you need a little bit more power on the hood, under the hood, you can extend it with Python. Mason has fast compile times, and it has built in extensions for the GStack and things like GetText localization. So there's no need for additional modules like some other build systems. We package up our applications with Flatpak. Now, in the traditional Linux distribution model, you often have maintainers that package other people's apps for them. That's because traditionally packaging is difficult and you have to package applications for each individual distribution separately. Well, with Flatpak, you only need a single manifest file in either JSON or YAML. And you can install Flatpak apps on all major Linux-based operating systems. Elementary provides a Flatpak runtime that includes most of the common build dependencies that you need. So likely your app's Flatpak file will look very similar to this one. But you can also easily vendor in any other dependencies you need in any version, even if it's not available in the host operating system. Flatpaks are sandboxed by default, and you can poke holes where you need them, but many libraries automatically use portals to escape the sandbox, which we'll talk about a little bit later. So here it is, a packaged native app in about 60 lines, not including metadata. Here it is, this is a whole app. For your metadata, you'll need two, uh, two files, a launcher file, that gets installed alongside your app and describes your app to the applications menu and doc. This is where you would declare your application system, or, uh, sorry, this is where you would declare your application wide actions. You also need an XML file for the app store. This is where you list screenshots, have your marketing copy or declare what category you want to be in, in the store. What about system APIs? Well, elementary is part of free desktop which is the cross-platform standard for desktop Linux. So when you write for our native APIs, your apps are automatically portable to desktops like GNOME and KDE, which run on Ubuntu, Fedora, Manjaro, and more. This includes things like sponsor actions, which appear in the context menu in the dock or the applications menu. And they're also available via search in elementary OS. If you have a music player, it includes media controls, so you can get track and artist info and album art. It also includes notifications, which can show images, badge icons, buttons, have a sense of urgency, or even replace old stale notifications with new updated ones. And on elementary OS, this includes the notification center and platform notification settings, plus portals, which are the new standard for sandbox apps. In elementary OS 6, we ship with a native file chooser portal and things like the color pickle, color picker. And we're planning to expand that more as we go. Now you need a toolkit to build graphical applications, right? The toolkit that we use is GTK. It has all of the common widgets that you'd expect like buttons, checkboxes, text entries, and more. And it works hand in hand with glib action. So actionable widgets, will automatically trigger global actions associated with them and are affected by global action states. So if you have a disabled action in your application, the widget will reflect that state. It also includes some widgets that are a little bit more difficult to build on the web, like popovers, switches, even progress bars, menus with submenus. And you can quickly create layouts with container widgets like the grid flow box or list box. Plus GTK comes with animation primitives. So you can cross fade elements, slide to reveal, create a paging UI or more without doing a bunch of custom drawing code. 
and all GTK widgets are styled with GTK CSS. See, widgets have nodes that follow the CSS box model. So almost anything that you can style in CSS on the web, you can do in GTK too. And of course, it comes with an inspector. So you can prototype your styles or change widget properties on the fly. GTK also has built-in localization features, including right to left layout support. So if your application is translated to Arabic or Hebrew, it'll automatically flip and display in the correct way in those languages. If you really love your programming language, you can keep that too, because GTK has bindings for all kinds of popular languages, including C, Python, JavaScript, and even Rust. There are two more toolkit components that we ship in the elementary Flatpak runtime. Granite, which is an elementary specific platform library, and Handy, which was developed by Purism to bring modern mobile toolkit features to GTK. Let's talk about Granite first. The main purpose of Granite is to make it easier to re-implement common design patterns and keep your apps up to date. If we use a design pattern multiple times when writing our apps, we make sure it gets into Granite. Take for example, this message dialog. It has a pretty complex layout. You can see that you have a large icon and a smaller icon. You have multiple lines of text with different styling. You have a place for command line output, a space for additional custom widgets, and multiple buttons, some of them with style classes. But you'll notice that in this example, there's no layout code. So if the design changes in the platform, your app won't be left behind when it uses Granite widgets. Granite also includes things like toasts, keyboard shortcut labels, and other platform-specific widgets and utilities. To see everything that Granite includes, including code samples, you can check it out on voladoc.org. This cycle, we've included Handy in our platform. Handy includes tons of multi-touch gesture primitives. Let me see if I can get my video to play here. Sorry about that. Handy includes tons of multi-touch gesture primitives, like this deck, which allows you to have back and forward navigation, which we use in system settings. You can see how straightforward it is to add one-to-one -one multi-touch gestures to your application with Handy, in just a few lines. It also includes things like the carousel, which is what we use in the applications menu and the onboarding app, and recently to draw the login and lock screen. This used to be a lot more difficult to do and require lots of custom drawing code, custom input handling, but now it's really straightforward to build these kind of interfaces with Handy. There's also Handy Window, which includes a less prescriptive way to draw client-side decorations. It's easier than ever to have multi-pane layouts like you see in this Tasks app example. You can see in the sample code here that we have two header bars, which is the widget that contains window controls. And they're packed into either side of a resizable pane. Handy Window also masks all the corners of your windows, even when they contain web content or video. So you don't have to port to GTK4 just yet to get those rounded corners. What about visual design? Well, since everything in GTK is styled with GTK CSS, you get excellent, consistent styling out of the box whenever you use native widgets. Elementary provides a complete CSS framework. Well, it's actually built in SAS, but it includes the dark style. And for most apps, you won't need to do any extra design work to support dark mode. There are also tons of built-in style class constants for things like text headers, small or dim labels, accent colors for text and for icons. And there are also semantic style classes for like warning or error states. Many widgets also have flat variants like for buttons or action bars. So you can be very expressive using only the built-in styles, but you can also load your own custom CSS style sheets. And we have a handful of exported CSS color variables 
like background colors, selection colors, and more. So you can stay consistent with the native styling, even in your custom styles. Now, what about icons? That's a pretty important part of your user interface, right? Well, elementary OS ships with over 400 open source SVG icons. This includes action icons, file types, devices, status icons, many more. We ship these in both full color and symbolic versions. And symbolic icons are automatically recolored in GTK to match the text color in light or dark mode. And you can use those style classes for semantic colors on the icons as well. Plus, you can use custom CSS to make sure that these icons match your brand. There's also right to left language variants. So when your application is localized, the arrows will still point the right way. And all of these icons are hinted into platform native sizes. So whether you're using a large icon in something like a dialog or a small icon in something like a button, they'll always be pixel perfect. And you can easily bundle your own icons as well, which we have documentation for in our developer guide. What about developer tools? What kind of tools are we using to build these applications? Well, Elementary OS comes with some great dev tools right out of the box. We have files with the smart path bar and the column view. We have a modern terminal with process completion notifications that even show exit status. And we have natural copy paste shortcuts. So you don't have to remember to hold down the shift key in the terminal. It also comes with multi-line and pseudo paste protection and other handy features like this. And there are Git integration in both files and in code. And all three of these applications come with browser class tabs and have features like tab duplication and tab close history. And there are lots of highly discoverable keyboard shortcuts in the context menus and tooltips. And not just in these apps, but in all of the apps that ship with elementary OS and even the operating system itself. But unlike other platforms, you're not locked into our tools. Many popular cross-platform apps are already available to sideload from FlatHub. You can use whatever you like, even when it comes time to publish. Because publishing, it's just GitHub. There's no new workflow. We have a minimal dashboard to submit your Git URL. But your issues, release tags, project management, and everything else stays on GitHub. Our review workflow is even built around GitHub pull requests. So you can see where your app is in the review queue, who's reviewing it, comments, and more. The Flatpak Builder action that we use to publish your app in App Center is also open source. So you can use it in your own CI. And it uses GitHub artifacts whenever a build is run. So there are no complicated instructions or special apps needed to test fix or feature branches with your users. You don't have to worry about user limits or signups like some other platforms. Just download the bundle file and install with sideload. Our payments backend is built on Stripe Connect, which is available in 44 countries, with more being added. And Stripe includes tools to start your own business in case you still need to incorporate. Unlike other platforms, there are no signup fees to publish an App Center. So we only make money when you make money. So this is our platform in 2021. You can find all the documentation on developer.elementary.io. One of the major goals that we have with our documentation is to try to give you more wins more quickly. So you could build an MVP on day one using something like those three files that I showed you from earlier. And our developer guide doesn't just include code like some other guides. It's more holistic, like our platform. It includes the build system, packaging, and even things like localization. We have full guides and code samples for important system APIs with tons more available on Validoc.org. 
and there are links to more external education resources, like the Linux Foundation's free class on software licensing. We tried to design our human interface guidelines around answering your design questions and providing a foundation for design thinking. So it's hopefully a little less dry than some of the other guides you've read. And elementary OS is completely open source, so you can get involved and help shape the platform. If an API doesn't exist, you can be a part of creating it. It's not a one way street like some other platforms. So of course we have some documentation available to help you get started as a contributor. All of our docs, just like our code, are open source. They're simple markdown files available on GitHub. So you can file issue reports or use GitHub discussions. We're always trying to grow our documentation and we use your feedback to inform where our focus goes next. So back to EDW. This is our way to reach out to you, to start more conversations about native open source app development, to provide the resources for new developers to learn. I want to give a special shout out to our GitHub sponsors and everyone buying EDW merch. Raising funds is a really important part of growing this event. GitHub sponsors and store purchases help us towards that goal. And we're really hoping to do an in-person event next year. I also want to give big shout outs to Jupiter Broadcasting for putting together the live stream and helping us moderate. I'm really excited to answer all of your questions about the platform and EDW, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the talks. Good morning. Welcome to day one of the Elementary Developer Weekend. My name is Chris. My name is Wes, and now a live Q&A with founder Daniel Foray and co-founder Cassidy Blady. Hello, gentlemen. Hey, Dan. Hey, how's it going? Good morning. Hey, thanks for your uh, your great talk there. And we've got some some great questions that I had after your talk and also from the chat. Uh, anybody else in the chat who has more questions, feel free to drop them in there and we'll be monitoring it as we go. So um, as a platform, some people might wonder, how big is it? How big is elementary OS? That's a really good question. Um, so as you know, Cass, but as our audience may not know, uh, we don't collect any sort of telemetry in elementary OS, right? So uh, the real answer to that question is we don't really know how many users we have. Um, what we do know is how many downloads we have, which doesn't really reflect uh, the number of users, but it can kind of give us a rough idea of, you know, how many people are trying out elementary OS. And uh, the latest stat we have for that is that I believe uh, elementary OS 5 has been downloaded about 1.6 million times. And um, that doesn't include a little bit of gap because we switch our analytics over to the open source plausible analytics, which you can see public. Uh, I believe the URL for that is uh, plausible uh, dot is it IO? Do you have that handy cast? Yeah, it's <laughs> plausible, plausible dot IO dot IO <laughs> slash elementary dot IO. <laughs> There you go, easy enough. And that also doesn't include um, torrent downloads either. So the uh, number of people downloading Elementary OS could be much, much higher. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, and that's just OS 5 as well. So, you know, that doesn't include right. all the previous versions and uh, we'll see where we, where we get with Elementary OS 6 when it's released as well. Um, so if developers want to get their hands on Elementary OS 6 to start actually um, you know, building and, and developing their apps, where do they go to do that? Yeah, we have uh, builds of Elementary OS beta available publicly for free at builds.elementary.io. And we also have an early access system where we do daily builds, not because betas are just kind of snapshots, but we have daily builds in the early access uh, that you can get by becoming a GitHub sponsor. Awesome. Now, during the state of the platform, you talked about some of the technical advantages for developers with native development compared to something like web development. Um, what do you see as user advantages of native apps compared to other technologies? 
Yeah, there, there's a couple of really big ones there. And I think one of the biggest ones is performance and resource usage, right? Like immediately you see when you compare to uh, some other non-native uh, web platforms like Electron, uh, that you can have a, a fairly simple app that actually uses a ton of resources to do kind of basic things. So the native apps are a lot more performant. But they also have much better integration with system APIs, especially like I was talking about before with some of the free desktop APIs, uh, things like notifications, right, or the dark style now. Um, but there's also some elementary OS uh, specific things that work a little bit better, like the conceal text feature in screenshot. Awesome. Yeah, so it's just way more integrated for, for users and way better experience there and all around. Awesome. Let's see, checking for some more questions here. Uh, da, 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 da. So um, you showed a lot of platform features in the talk, uh, but for developers who are already building for OS 5, elementary OS 5, what are some of um, maybe the biggest or your favorite new features in elementary OS 6 for developers? That's a great question. Yeah. So for uh, elementary OS six, one of the real big things we did, excuse me, is we uh, rewrote our style sheet completely from scratch. So we have this brand new SAS style sheet. And so the styles, I think, are a lot more clear, a lot more contrasty. We're using a lot more light and shadow. We added a really great dark style, uh, which your apps can take advantage of now. And we have accent color support, which is really cool. So uh, our users can express themselves a little bit more through the accent color that they choose. But you can also use it to express your brand in your app. Uh, another really big thing that we included this cycle was handy. And that's where I talked about, you could use uh, one to one multi-touch gestures in your app with things like the deck and the carousel, uh, rounded corners with handy window, even for video and web content. And there's uh, tons of other new features in Granite too. Awesome, yeah, lots, of, lots of new good stuff. Yeah. All right. Let's say a developer has an app that they've developed and written uh, on elementary OS 6. How, you know, they've, they've gone the, through the work to port it um, to Flatpak. How can they submit it today? So the, um, the App Center dashboard that I talked about is something that's kind of still in development and should be public really soon. Um, so just hang on real tight for that. But we are going to be uh, reaching out to some developers who have submitted to App Center in the past uh, to do a little bit more of a manual publishing process with them and help make sure that everything ports over correctly. Awesome. So we should start to see more apps in that, uh, that App Center Flatpak repository soon. Yep. Great. During the talk, uh, you mentioned something about over 400 icons um, being provided by the platform itself. Can you expand on that a little bit? Um, you know, you, there's there's icons, but then there's the different the hinting sizes. Yeah. So the way. Um icons mainly work in, in our platform is their names based and they try to use like semantic names. So you could have an, an icon name like dialogue dash information, right? And this name actually represents a lot of different icons. So it'll represent uh, the icons that are hinted in each size from uh, 16 pixels all the way up to uh, 64 pixels, or in some cases, 128 pixels. And then if you append uh, the namespace dash symbolic, then you get symbolic versions of those icons. And those can be hinted in multiple sizes as well. And then um, the toolkit will automatically append uh, dash RTL for right to left localization. So one icon name uh, can actually represent like tons of different icons. So yeah. we have about 400 icon names, but it represents thousands and thousands of actual icons. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That's, there's so much work. I mean, elementary OS started in the early days as an icon set. <laughs> so there's uh, there's obviously lots of legacy there and lots of um, lots of great resources for developers in icons. Let's see, checking the chat for more questions here. Um, oh, we had a couple of questions about non-native toolkits. Um, can you publish an app set in App Center with toolkits other than GTK? 
Um, no, we've decided to stick with just GTK because we really want to focus on that tight native integration, that consistent visual style, and make sure that the platform features are working really well. And it's not just things um, like how something looks or even how it feels in some cases, which can be imitated a little bit, but things like localization support, right? The right to left language handling or accessibility features. A lot of times, uh, non native apps won't work with accessibility tools like screen readers. And that's really important for us is to make sure that we can make that promise that when you download an app from App Center, that all the system features are going to work with it. Yeah, that makes that makes sense. Um, I'm not sure how to pronounce names here, so I'm sorry in the chat if I butcher your name if you ask a question. Um, looks like Stainslaw says, uh, will there be any statistics in the developer dashboard, like how many people are using my apps, etc.? Um, you know, I think that's something that's a little bit difficult because we want to avoid uh, any kind of user tracking or telemetry, right? So having like an active user count would require uh, your app to, to kind of send information continuously back. And, and we really want to avoid that kind of um like privacy invading kind of technology. Uh, but one thing that uh, we would like to do is provide some more anonymous statistics like download numbers. Yeah. Yeah. And I think a lot of that stuff is built into um, Flatpak and how, how the Flatpak, Flatpak backend works. So that anonymous usage would be, would be great to have. Um, I'm not sure if there's an issue filed on the project or not, but um, if you want to check github.com slash elementary slash app center dash dashboard, um, the development's all happening in the open there, and you can file issues for things like download stats. Uh, Childish Giant says, are there any plans to add more easily accessible developer support for those getting into making native apps? I've had some stumbling blocks where I cannot find uh, solutions or support. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, a real big advantage for us of having uh, all our documentation open source is that we can make use of GitHub's native platform features and discussions are a really cool way to uh, make sure that you can be involved in the kind of community that's creating the educational materials there. So I would recommend you go to uh, our docs page on GitHub. So github.com forward slash elementary forward slash docs and and then go to discussions and you can start a discussion there about something that you're having trouble with and then we can figure out uh, how to solve that problem with you and then uh, we could take that and turn it into some great documentation for other people too yeah awesome yeah it's such an advantage of doing everything open um, and collaboratively is it, it can improve for everybody um zisan ahmad says should i learn vala to contribute to elementary os's source code Yes, and that's actually one of the really awesome things about uh, elementary in general is that we have standardized on a single programming language. So in some other cases, it can be difficult uh, to contribute to open source platforms. We have to learn a myriad of languages, right? But with uh, elementary and elementary OS, uh, if you learn Vala, then you can contribute to any software that we develop. And there's actually a great talk uh, tomorrow morning as well. First thing, uh, how to contribute to elementary OS that covers um, the point of view from a new contributor and how to get involved. So I would highly recommend you check that talk out as well. Let's see, more questions here. Um, Colin asks, where can we send feedback about things like the applications menu? Yeah, uh, since everything is open source and, and we're all focused on uh, GitHub, you can go and file uh, a new issue on GitHub issues. Uh, so for the applications menu specifically, that's github.com forward slash elementary forward slash applications dash menu. And we have great issue templates there that make it really easy uh, for you to file really great uh, issues and explain, you know, the kind of problem you're having and, and the kind of solution that you're looking for. And then we'll work with you there to figure that out. So we're always open to feedback on, on any components, and, and it's all open. Awesome, yeah. Um, and another another thing is the, the feedback app itself. If you're on elementary OS, yeah. um, you can search for feedback or issue, I believe, in the applications menu and open an issue there um, right from the operating system. It'll guide you to the right place on GitHub. Um, let's see. Selwyn Oren. 
uh, says, very interested in why the choice for Flatpak as opposed to other technologies like maybe App Image. Yeah, so, uh, you know, it's funny, we actually looked into uh, App Image quite a long time ago when it was first coming out. And um, one of the major deficiencies of App Image is that it doesn't really include um, any kind of package management and update flow. Uh oh, my camera just went to sleep. Uh, am I back? <laughs> You're back. Um, all right. So uh, that's kind of um, one of the major drawbacks there. But also, you know, as we're trying to scale our application development, uh, sandboxing is is really important. And we're starting to see more and more on other popular platforms that uh, when certain app developers have free reign on the system, that they always have the user's best interests in mind or that users don't always get to control their experience. So Flatpak kind of offers us like quite a lot of things in terms of application sandboxing so that you can make sure that applications are privacy respecting and secure. It has a really great update system built in with things like Delta updates. So you're only downloading the difference uh, between the version you have and the new version, which is really great for low bandwidth situations. And uh, it also, um, <laughs> and it also allows you to use platforms and runtimes so that you don't have to vendor in absolutely everything into each bundle. They can still share some platform dependencies, but if you do need to include additional dependencies, then that's something that you can do. So you kind of get the best of both worlds. Plus Flatpak is built around kind of a decentralized system, which is similar um, to what we have with existing um, package management, where you can spin up your own repositories if you want. So uh, if something ever happens and elementary goes away, then you know someone could spin up a Flatpak repository. Or if you want to sideload Flatpaks from a different repository, like say Flathub, uh, you could totally do that. So uh, we think that it's kind of a, a better technology that offers a lot more of the features we're looking for. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and there's that blog post. Um, I don't have the URL on hand, but on uh, the blog.elementary.io, um, there's where we talk about the flat pack decision. There's, we talk about all those, all those um, things there and, and go into a little more detail as well if you're interested in following up on that. All right, let's see. More questions from the chat. Where did we leave off here? Um, somebody asked what the elementary OS origin story is. I don't think we have time to get into that right now. We've gotten into it on several <laughs> podcasts and things in the past, though. Um, there's a couple of questions about Handy specifically and um, how that interacts with GNOME, with Libidweta. Um Can you touch on that a little bit? Yeah, um, so there's kind of an ongoing conversation right now among a few different organizations about uh, the future of GTK itself and some of these uh, what we're calling HIG libraries like Granite and Handy uh, and now LibAbWeta. And uh, so we're, we're, we're kind of all um, getting together and thinking about how we want to build applications in the future uh, and, and where these things lie. But uh, for now, you know, none of that changes in the elementary flat pack platform. And uh, I think in the future that we'll probably still use components from things like LibAbWeta uh, or LibDazzle maybe. Uh, and it depends on um, what we can as a group decide that uh, works better as something in GTK that we're all sharing or what we're deciding that's more specific to each platform. So it's kind of an evolving story, but uh, I think that um, it'll become better and better as we go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and, and that's a, another awesome thing about open source is, you know, we're in constant conversation with um, not only people developing on elementary OS, but with GNOME, with people that are working on free desktop standards. Um, so it's always an open conversation. Um, Octavian Merla says, is it possible to uh, develop elementary OS applications on other distribution. I think they're saying to distribute uh, elementary OS applications on other distributions, um, like on Fedora with the Pantheon desktop group or an Ubuntu LTS with a PPA. 
Yeah, so that's kind of one of the big things um, that we wanted to focus on with the App Center for Everyone campaign and um, moving to Flatpak is that when applications are published as Flatpak packages, you can install the App Center Flatpak remote on any Linux distribution and get those apps. So you don't need to use uh, PPAs or copper repositories or mm -hmm. anything like that. You don't have to package apps in multiple formats. You can just distribute them as Flatpak once and then any can install them awesome i think we're probably out of time for a question and answer now if i'm looking at my clock correctly gentlemen thank you